So good morning. I see that people are connecting. I'll wait a couple more seconds to give everyone the time uh, to join the webinar. Okay, so it's 10.31, so I think it's time to start. First of all, again, good morning and a very warm welcome to everyone. My name is Silvia Carta and I'm a policy analyst at the European Policy Center. I am very pleased to welcome you all at today's policy dialogue, which is organized by the EPC in the context of the MEDAM project. MEDAM stands for Mercator Dialogue on Asylum and Migration and is a project funded by Stiftung Mercator. And it is jointly carried out by the EPC, the Migration Policy Center, and the Kiel Institute for the World's Economy. So today's event looks at the conclusions of the AU-EU Summit on Migration and Mobility. We were hoping to organize this event already two years ago when the summit was postponed for the first time. So we are particularly happy to host this discussion today. We have over 200 participants who have registered. So it is clear that the topic remains of great interest. And we are of course convinced that this conversation is highly timely, despite the fact that migration was not at the top of the agenda of the summit last week. So already prior to the summit, the expectations for the AU and the EU to find real progress on migration were not very high due to the long-standing divide on a number of key issues, uh, such as return and their mission, for example. So against this background, the summit final declaration may not be a major breakthrough, but there are some interesting details that deserve to be discussed, ranging from the references to sustainable reintegration and the commitment to address forced displacement. We will also, of course, focus on uh, legal migration opportunities, which continue to feature among the joint priorities of the AU and the EU, but remain to be further developed. So today's event will allow us to unpack the summit conclusions, to reflect on what has not been discussed, but also to think of ways to bring forward cooperation on migration. Just um, one final housekeeping remark before we start. This is a public event and it will be recorded and available on the EPC's YouTube channel. So I'm now happy to introduce you to the moderator of the debate, Dr. Meari Maru, who is a professor at the Migration Policy Center, as well, of course, um, a Madam researcher who worked extensively on AUU relations. So I really hope that you'll enjoy the event and I'm also looking forward to an interesting discussion. Over to you, Meari. Good morning and thank you, Silvia, for the brief introduction. Um, very glad to joining you uh, today and um, welcome all of you to this uh, um, webinar um, and this uh, online policy dialogue. Uh, as uh, Silvia has said, um, this is an, an important uh, event, both uh, because it has been some time since we discussed about uh, the AU-EU uh, summit uh, and uh, in relation to migration and mobility cooperation, but also uh, for the uh, expectations that we had uh, from the summit uh, and also those uh, issues that not only those issues that have been mentioned in the AU joint um, vision, AU EU joint vision for 2030, but also for those that are not really mentioned in the uh, declaration itself. So now we will have uh, a more in-depth discussion. This is a debrief, so we'll have a chance to discuss all things, not only those that have been uh, discussed or included in the declaration itself or the vision itself, but also on those things that are not included. And perhaps this will be an opportunity to interrogate more and uh, uh, also forward advance uh, some suggestions with regard to what should have been included and what should be included in, perhaps in a more detailed plan that uh, will come uh, in the future. Um, for this session, we have, uh, uh, we'll uh, end our session uh, on at 1200 hours and um, uh, we have speakers, uh, three uh, renowned speakers here 
in this field. We have Nicolas uh, Martinez, advisor on migration and maritime security, European External Action Service. And we have also Otilia uh, Anna, uh, head of special projects uh, in Institute for Security Studies and Anna Cole uh, uh, from the head of migration and mobility program from European Center for uh, development policy management. Uh, three of uh, three of us, three of uh, the speakers will give us the background for this discussion, and uh, they have uh, uh, certain areas that they will cover, and then we will open it for uh, question and answer, uh, which I will be facilitating immediately after they uh, finish their uh, brief uh, uh, introductory uh, remarks. So in that order, I would like to give uh, the first opportunity to Nicholas. Uh, uh, we will start with him and then uh, uh, then Otilia and then Anna. Um, Nicholas, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, Mehari, and uh, good morning to all the, uh, the people that are following us. And thank you also. Uh, for uh, for the initiative to organize this debriefing, I think it is very timely and uh, and um, could uh, maybe uh, uh, clear uh, some ideas that could be uh, hanging uh, over uh, all of us after the the meeting last week in Brussels. Uh, as you said, I'm uh, I work inside the African Department at, at the European External Action Service, so I'm. Uh, Public officials, so do not expect from me any uh, any radical declaration. Uh, and uh, but I will try to be as informative as possible to uh, provide you with information from inside of what happened uh, last week. In this sense, uh, first of all, maybe uh, uh, just to say that uh, the negotiation of the paragraph on migration the paragraph of the declaration about migration uh, was one of the one that uh, uh, could be easily uh, uh, achieved. And, um, and in fact, uh, if the negotiation uh, uh, lasted till, uh, uh, I would say, Friday morning for the declaration, uh, if I am not wrong, uh, around uh, Wednesday, we already had some kind of agreed language for the migration paragraph. So it was not uh, as it happened before, it was not uh, difficult to achieve this agreement. I think this is a positive issue and I may not uh, be completely in agreement to what uh, Silvia said, uh, that uh, this is a way to uh, give low profile to migration. I think on the contrary, that could be interpreted as a way of inserting migration and mobility uh, in the continuity of our dialogues. And our dialogues, and I talk in plural, that we have been uh, carrying out since, uh, in particular, since 2015. And, uh, and that, that could uh, also express some maturity in the dialogue about migration and mobility in which each side, and each side is uh, not monolithic. I mean, the European side with its uh, differences and its, its different uh, uh, approaches, and the African side as well with uh, its different views, they are uh, adapting and, uh, and, and uh, trying to uh, get the maximum of their, this reality, of this complex reality. Uh, uh, and definitely, I think now everybody is, is more aware of what which are the priorities of the other side. So uh, uh, in general term for me, that was a, a, a good uh, indicator. And I have to say that this uh, good indicator was confirmed on Friday morning. Uh, you know, uh, the summit uh, this time uh, was organized differently from uh, uh, previous times. Uh, instead of have a big plenary <coughs> with, with uh, a long uh, series of uh, speeches, this time uh, uh, seven round tables were organized with different subjects, and uh, in particular on Friday morning, uh, the, uh, the thematic roundtable about education, culture, and vocational training, migration and mobility was organized. Uh, so uh, during this uh, roundtable, 
uh, let me tell you that uh, there, 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 there was the presence of 12 EU uh, uh, member states, EU heads uh, of state or government, and uh, 16 uh, African Union member states, again, uh, represented by their heads of state or government or sometimes uh, foreign ministers and also uh, the uh, chairperson of the African Union Commission, Musa Faki, was present as well in this round table, together with the Secretary General of the uh, Organization International de la Francophonie, and also Antonio Vitorino, uh, the, the, the Director General of uh, IOM. So it was, I mean, a, a significant uh, presence, and uh, the, the discussion, I think it was a good idea as well, and this is more from a personal point of view, to integrate the discussion on uh, migration and mobility inside the discussion on education, culture, and vocational training. I think it was a good idea because if you look at the declaration, the final paragraph, there is a, a clear impetus to put youth and women at the center of uh, all efforts uh, uh, to be done uh, around migration and mobility. And, and this was uh, confirmed again during the round table. If uh, uh, I go through the uh, the, the summary of the discussions, uh, again, uh, migration and mobility issues were uh, put in front, and later on, uh, there were uh, more uh, discussion of, of education, culture, and vocational training. And if I have to uh, single out uh, specific issues that uh, were uh, new this time, or at least that got a more uh, prominent uh, place this time, for example, the, the, during the, the discussions, during the round table, um, after uh, it was confirmed this uh, way of looking at migration and mobility in a comprehensive manner, it means uh, the, this agreed language that, uh, that came out of the uh, Valletta Summit in 2015, going from the root causes till uh, return, readmission, and reintegration. Uh, after uh, confirming that, there was the issue of legal migration, the one that came up, that came out. And, and, and in this legal migration, in my point, uh, from my point of view, there were two issues, very interesting one. One was the fact that uh, the issue of the brain drain should be uh, studied and should be uh, in some way avoided or, or trying to uh, get the maximum uh, I mean, avoiding the uh, brain drain, but also optimizing the brain gain uh, 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 in countries of origin. And the second thing in this uh, initial discussion was the fact that uh, we have already a lot of lessons that could be learned from the successful uh, pilot projects that, the, uh, that exist on legal migration. This is something that we, uh, we don't talk, uh, we do not talk too much about that. But the fact is that this pilot progress on legal migration exists. Uh, and, and, and the fact that the leaders recognize that we should try to apply the lessons to other uh, similar initiatives, I think it was a very good thing. Uh, after that, there was also a lot of discussion about the intra-African mobility, the free movement protocol, which I think is a way to recognize something that we know that uh, most of the movement uh, 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 most of the movement happens in South Africa. And also there are difficulties in South Africa for those movements to happen and see how also our joint work will uh, support uh, and help on that. There was also a mention to the trilateral AU, EU, UN task force. And, uh, and uh, just let me finalize uh, uh, in this uh, initial briefing, mentioning that one of the agreements during the round table, we are still trying to understand exactly what, what, what it means. Uh, they was agreed the creation of EU AU Technical Committee on Mobility. Uh, I think uh, what uh, uh, it is, uh, this decision expresses is the fact that we have to show results. This is something that there is also inside the declaration what, when it is mentioned the delivering on, on, key, on key priorities. So this sense, uh, I think this is the, the main uh, message we have behind the technical committee. But as I said, we are still trying to identify exactly what the leaders 
I wanted to express with this decision. So in general terms, and I'm ending here, I'm hurry, I think we have to insert in the continuity. And it was good that migration did not absorb the, uh, the attention of the summit. And uh, that maturity should now be reflected in our bilateral, in our regional, or in our continental dialogues with the African Union. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nicolas. Uh, I think this this gives and frames the, the, the discussion we will have. I'm sure, Nicolas, you will get a lot of questions, even if you are uh, public, uh, you're holding public office and people will be asking you. And we know um, uh, uh, there will be a lot of questions. Those of you who have questions, please uh, uh, write to them and my colleagues will uh, let me know the questions, how to allocate to who, which uh, speaker. But uh, let's continue the conversation. I think it's a, uh, Nicholas has started with good, um, uh, if you wish, debate uh, on what uh, Sylvia has said uh, in her remarks about uh, the low attention migration and mobility has been given. And he is asserting uh, uh, that it was uh, actually given enough uh, attention as such. And he has provided us some detail and uh, I think that's uh, why he thinks also we are provided. That's what we would uh, like to do, interrogate those kind of questions. Um, now I would like to invite uh, Otilia uh, joining us from South Africa. Um, and uh, sh she is working with Institute for Security Studies. So many of us know her. And she will give us a brief uh, remark uh, like Nicolas did. Uh, in a very interactive uh, manner, and then we'll continue. Uh, Othelia, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mehari. Uh, please confirm if I'm both visible and audible because my internet has been difficult uh, you, this morning. You are visible and audible. I mean, we can hear you very well. Please go ahead, yeah. Great, uh, thank you. And uh, a special thanks, uh, obviously, to the organizers for, for this uh, discussion. I will start where Nicholas ended, which was to say, um, you know, from the technical committee side, but really from the implementation side, um, still uh, a lot needs to be worked through. And I stop there because obviously the summit between uh, the African and European leaders is in itself not the panacea of discussions um, of areas of cooperation, even if they wanted it to be. It's, it's, it's frankly impossible to, to, to make it that. So going to um, uh, specifically on the declaration itself, but then looking at perhaps what would be that joint vision, I'll raise perhaps some uh, positive uh, aspects first, and then look to some of the areas where perhaps we, we haven't uh, progressed. Um, and, I, and, I, and I need to premise my, my um, remarks this morning with the fact that, of course, uh, both uh, the AU uh, and the European Union uh, convened last week in, in, in good faith, but of course, uh, other uh, global developments could have been weighing heavy on the minds of, of the discussants, so to speak. So first on the, the positives, uh, Nicolas has already alluded to these. This include trying, at very least to rethink migration, not only from a securitized lens uh, or a migration governance lens, but also connecting it with the very realities of uh, a young African continent, which I dare stress um, moves primarily within the African continent, but also recognizing the lack sometimes of economic and other opportunities at home that lead people to move. So underscoring the need to look at migration and development together, not migration or development. For me, that's positive. It's positive because at least for the African Union on paper, the relationship between migration, mobility and development has always been understood. Now I say on paper because the practice can sometimes differ within regions, but this is not a conversation for that. The, the next uh, positive aspect is around looking towards encouraging legal migration and mobility, um, centering this still on questions around labor, 
but recognizing again that labor mobility will remain a key issue both for Africa and Europe and between the two continents. The third positive aspect is around rethinking and relooking at how we consider protection and asylum. So protection of those already granted uh, their refugee status and also those who will be seeking uh, asylum. Again, on paper, of course, the practice is something that we need to look for. Then I look to what could be still uh, hangups that we have within the partnership. These hangups include an overwhelming focus on questions around irregular migration, smuggling and trafficking, without really connecting that with an environment that doesn't enable greater legal movement. So it's one thing to underscore the, the, the grave impact, peace, security, and otherwise of irregular channels of movement, including the many people that die um, on their perilous journeys, not only crossing to Europe, but within the African continent itself. It's a whole other thing altogether to reflect on why it is people choose these journeys. Why, for example, opting for legal channels may not always be the default option for a lot of people. It's barriers to entry related to access that, that result in this. So while there were discussions around smuggling and trafficking of persons, it was almost as if this remains the default. And yet we know, at least from IOM's reporting, but also a range of organizations, including those represented here, um, that the majority of people would prefer legal channels of movement, not least because it allows for legal residence, but also it allows for you to be a better contributor, uh, developmentally or otherwise, into the society that you're in. But if people are criminalized from point of departure, or if it's difficult for them to be able to have access, then ultimately what we do, whether intentionally or otherwise, is we push people towards irregular channels of movement, which means documentation becomes harder. And it means the questions around the intersections between migration and criminality become more pronounced, more than they should be. So I say this is a step back, not because smuggling and trafficking of persons should not be focused on, not because questions around return, readmission and reintegration should not also be focused on, but because if that still is regarded as a point of departure, at least by one party to the discussions, it does mean it almost eclipses what is the real issue. The real issue, and I'm going to use a slight rephrasing here, and I'll end on this point, Mari, so that we can go really into the discussion. It is perhaps to change the way we speak about the reasons why people move to shift away from a language of root causes, a language which is rooted in, in itself in a push factor over a pull uh, factor analysis, but also a language that says people, even those who are moving voluntarily, are not entirely doing so voluntarily. There's something that's making them move. Recognizing that questions around education, which has been raised, around a young population already highlighted, around other dynamics related to climate, related to seeking better opportunities and livelihoods are all very important. My plea today, which is really focusing on what has been discussed, how it's being discussed, but then picking up from where Nikolai ended, which is what then, practically, what do we do? It is about realizing again and stressing this, that people will move, that we need to be thinking about making conditions conducive for staying, for those that want to stay, but also ensuring that legal pathways are the default, not the alternative. Thank you, Mari. Thank you, Ochilia. I think this is good um, and we, have also um, the main issues that has been debated in some circles. I have also published a, a, sh a short blog post uh, today on the same, uh, including legal pathways are the very important issue that need to be 
considered in um, the uh, uh, not only in the uh, vision itself, but uh, in the partnership as important aspect of this cooperation. Let me ask now uh, Anna uh, to come in and provide her uh, feedback before we open it for question and answer. Uh, for those of you who are uh, following this uh, webinar, if you have question, you can drop it on the chat room and then um, I will moderate it from here. Uh, but now back to Anna, you have the floor. Thank you, Mehari. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me and for organizing this timely debate. Um, I want to give a couple of remarks on my impressions of uh, the summit and the declaration, and then maybe um, highlight some topics that I think uh, could be useful to look into, into the future, especially if there's, for example, an EU AU technical committee on mobility set up. Um, there may be a couple of aspects that have been missing in the discussions which would be worthwhile to look into. I think Nicolas and Otilia already mentioned quite um, a lot of important aspects. Um, to me, I think the framing of migration and mobility as part of the education and youth um, was an, um, a, an interesting um, development. And to me, it's, it's a good uh, approach forward because it frames it in a more positive light and it goes away from the maybe more narrow securitized um, Framing At the same time, it's also not new. I mean, under the Joint Africa Youth Strategy, migration mobility was part of the education um, partnership. And they're actually, I think it'd be useful to go back and, and learn some lessons from, from um, that, that partnership. Um, uh, having said that, I think if I read the text of the final um, uh, overall outcome declaration, it still reads to me a bit more strongly focused on the security and the negative aspects. I mean, upfront, there are four issues after the principles of a balanced and comprehensive approach and joint responsibility. It's basically um, preventing irregular migration, then enhancing cooperation against smuggling and trafficking, then strengthening border management, and then effective return and readmission. Then later, we come to protection and, as a final thought, uh, legal migration. So, um, Happy to hear that Nicholas has said the discussion in the roundtable were quite different and, and focused a lot more on, on the legal migration and, and mobility and opportunity aspects, um, which is an important side of the coin, obviously. To me, also the framing, if I go back to the Kigali Declaration, for example, which was um, yeah, ministerial meeting of foreign affairs ministers, so maybe also not at the head of state level, but it was a very different framing in spirit. Um, and, and I think they're going going back to a more sort of rights based long term approach to migration, focusing on harnessing positive aspects is definitely useful and I would have wished that the overall declaration would have reflected that um, possibly a bit more but but then, as Nicola said it's it's very much in the detail and in the follow up also. Um, and. Here, I wanted to give a couple of points where I think more discussions can be had between the EU and, and uh, the AU going forward and with the member states. Um, the first one, which I find interesting, is that in all the discussion also in Valletta and leading up to the issue of um, climate change and the link to migration and displacement has not um, had a strong priority so far. And I think it's growing in... in um, in priority on the ground. So I think there, there needs to be some discussions to be had. At the European level, the council presidency has kicked off discussions on making this link. There is also on the African continent, obviously the Africa Climate Mobility Initiative. So there are separate discussions happening, but to me, I think this discussion needs to become into more strongly in the EU relations as well. Second uh, topic I find is, um, more in-depth discussion on the engagement of the European Coast and Border Guard, Frontex. <clears throat> there is um, now also a stronger push to have more cooperation. Um, Frontex has been taking over also the European Return and Reintegration Network. Um, more activities with partners in Africa are planned. At the same time, um, Frontex is under scrutiny for um, protection issues, not um, in Africa per se, but also on, at, um, in, in Europe itself and, and on the shores. So I think here there is a 
role also to discuss how to ensure protection, um, human rights standards, norms are up front and center in strengthened cooperation between agencies um, on smuggling and trafficking and, and irregular migration. A third point is the role of increasing role of di digital technology in migration governance. Uh, to me, there is, um, it, I mean, with digital technology and transformation in general, but on migration governance specifically, a, quite a number of um, aspects ethical and normative aspects that need to be discussed. Um, digital migration tools are increasingly being used for migration governance. They are not, um, uh, yeah, they're, they're biases that can um, be um, introduced there. There are um, ethical concerns with some of them. Um, at the same time, there's huge opportunities of using um, tools to, to improve migration governance, but the EU and the AU are standard setting and, and uh, bodies and can play a role in providing guidance and normative frameworks. So it's interesting for me that the, this hasn't yet um, entered the, the discussion. So to ensure uh, a joint approach to fair migration management, I think it's an essential point for the future to tackle. And then... Um, uh, fourth point, just a quick one, interesting to me that diaspora is not mentioned strongly anymore, where it, where it was actually quite prominent in Kigali, uh, um, where the outcome highlighted the role of diaspora in Europe and in Africa as key to promoting also deeper cultural mutual understanding, and they can play a role as well in the talent partnerships and um, in other relations on migration, it, it's been quite absent in the discussions on, on this summit. Um, and finally, I mean, we talk a lot about labor mobility, and I'm happy to hear that there are sort of shifts in the discussions happening, and that the issue of rain drain, for example, entered um, the, the, the discussion. To me, that's not surprising, because I feel at the strategic level, um, with more and more calls for legal pathways and more European countries also looking to Africa to recruit talent and labor, maybe still cautiously, but I think there's some change happening. And this directly is mainly directed at high school labor because um, European countries also need um, high school for uh, labor for their economies. Um, I think there needs to be a sort of more strategic discussion what that means in the longer term future of the mobility relations between EU and Africa. Um, what concerns existed around brain drain um, and brain gain and, and the circularity possibly um, have to be taken seriously. Um, and I think there needs to be some increased thinking on what the sort of talent partnership uh, initiatives and larger scale and pilot uh, um, um, increasing the uh, scaling up the pilot projects, for example, means for um, also sustainable economic development in, in Africa and what it means for intra-African migration. So I stop here and I'm looking forward to, to the debate um, and, and he hear what other participants have to, have to contribute and to, to say. Thank you, Anna. I think uh, this uh, adds more questions to the issues that uh, Othelia has uh, mentioned and uh, Nicolas in his uh, first uh, uh, intervention now would go to question and answer. Um, I see a few questions already on the, uh, the room. Uh, if there are more, I would like to encourage people either to uh, put their question in the chat room or um, they can raise their hand also. Uh, we will uh, we'll, we'll be able to um, give them a chance to uh, raise their question. But uh, I see one from Frank. <clears throat> Actually, um, his um, question are two, uh, but I will focus on the first one. Uh, and this is a general one. Uh, he says EU is not reciprocating when it comes to migration policies. And he says it is an imbalanced win-lose uh, partnership between Africa and the EU. Uh, and then he goes on uh, focusing on um, uh, the inequity, um, uh, inequity in terms of uh, free movement uh, of uh, Europeans within Africa, even for Africans movement within Africa being very difficult. 
but for Europeans, it's not the same. Uh, of course, I don't think he's saying that it's difficult for Africans, so it should be difficult for Europeans too. But he's saying why is it not easy for Africans also to travel to Europe uh, and within Africa. So anyone can respond to this. Uh, may I start with Nicholas and then I'll go to Otilia to respond um, to this question. Is it imbalance? Is it win-lose partnership? And if it's not, why do you say it's not, uh, Nicholas, you have? Well, um, I don't think I have a, a, a clear answer to this question. I mean, it is unbalanced. I mean, it is uh, more difficult for an African citizen. Let's say, let's be precise. For a national of an African country to try to Europe, that it happens normally for a a national of a European country to travel to uh, an African country. But uh, Frank also should recognize that sometimes intra-African barriers are uh, uh, block also that uh, uh, African nationals or national of African countries travel inside Africa. So it is not, uh, uh, and that happened also not only with uh, European citizens, but also with, with citizens coming from other parts of the world. So this is a, an interesting debate, but I don't think we have, we can only uh, uh, limit it to uh, what happened between uh, African citizen and European citizen. It, it has more, um, more uh, details to, to study to complete that. But uh, in general terms, the reality is that yes, I mean, I, 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 when I travel to, to Africa, I have to follow different procedures, get visas, but in general terms, I have less difficulties than uh, an African citizen, a normal African citizen, when uh, he or she wants to travel to Europe. But Mehari, uh, as I have the floor, I don't know whether I can also comment uh, briefly about what Anna has said. Eh? Yes. So, uh, some points, uh, I mean, in basic terms, I think we, we, we agree, and I'm happy to share this panel with, with Otilia and Anna. Uh, 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 let me uh, insist that uh, uh, we, we need to continue talking about irregular migration, and we need in particular to continue talking about uh, smuggling and traffic, because these are part of a human suffering that goes beyond borders and goes beyond uh, 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 national or, or continental interest. So this is there, this criminality is there, this risk is there, this suffering is there. So I don't think we should hide that. And there is also another thing uh, that we should keep in mind is that uh, uh, we also, when we talk uh, about irregular migration or our debate we base on irregular migration, we forget that in, 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 in numbers, irregular migration is a, a, a minor effect uh, contrary to the legal migration, to what really exists through the legal pathways. I'm not saying that this is easy. What I'm saying is that uh, 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 at least with Europe figures, when we talk about legal uh, ways of uh, reaching Europe, it is uh, much higher than the regular migration. So we cannot forget that. And also Otilia, I think rightly mentioned why not to focus more on at, at the origin. And, and, and she talks, she talked about education, youth, climate. I think Otilia, you, you forgot to mention the key word, which was governance as well. I mean, it is not only an economic factor, there is also a political factor, a governance factor. And, and uh, of course, uh, given the ownership to the, to, uh, to the African countries, but this is there and we should recognize that as well. And that's why in the declaration, and it was, it was proposed by the African side when talking about people uh, in need of international protection, uh, there was mention of, of asylum seekers, also refugees, uh, uh, also, the, they wanted to talk about displaced people uh, and vulnerable migrants. So uh, we, we, should, we should not forget that issue of governance. About the comments from Anna, uh, uh, Anna, don't, don't pay too much attention to the draft of the declaration. I mean, you know, uh, 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 I think it was on Wednesday or on Tuesday, uh, the steering committee uh, uh, lasted till four in the morning about the different discussions. So at, at, at that moment, at two in the morning, 
whether to put a first one paragraph or the other. I mean, I personally can tell you a couple of things that I would have done differently. Uh, and I think I agree with you why putting, I mean, after the general, the general, uh, um, uh, uh, the general expression of of the of um, of uh, the integrated comprehensive balance manner. Why we talk first about uh, uh, irregular migration and, and and smuggling traffic and not about the the positive side. I mean, I will have changed the order, but they were part of the of the of the discussion. It's, it's like why you may say why in the third line of the of the paragraph uh, we talk about national competencies. No. You, you know there are there are uh, uh, there are details that sometimes are essential to conclude the discussion. But so I don't think you should give too much importance to the drafting at the end. What remains is the the uh, atmosphere and in particular the good uh, the maturity to move forward to continue discussing and to continue finding uh, finding uh, solutions to this uh, Thank uh, you. common problem. Yeah? Yeah, I'll come back to you, Nicolas, uh, okay. on the okay. other issues. Maybe Othelia, do you want to respond to that or Anna? Othelia, go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. I must say, because Anna is my middle name, uh, when you say Othelia or Anna, do yes, you want to yes, respond? Yes. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll say yes both times. <laughs> Good for you. No, yeah. But, um, <laughs> Very, very quick responses to um, what's being said by by uh, Frank, and then perhaps uh, a minor um, stressing or underlining um, in response to what uh, Nicola has just said now. So, to to what Frank has said, I think the the issues around free movement within the African continent are issues that we mustn't just. Uh, you know, dismissed because we are having a conversation about the EU and the AU. We can speak about how the majority of people at about 80% move within the African continent and only 20 uh, leave the continent, not always going to Europe, also going towards the Middle East, uh, the Americas and greater Asia. We can have that conversation, but we also need to recognize that free movement on the African continent um, is as integral a push as any. Um, and, and I say this noting that there is a protocol related to free, uh, freedom of movement um, and then later on, uh, on residence, but this has been slow in terms of ratification on the part of member states. So on that point, I think it's worth stressing that if we are encouraging forms of freedom of movement, that we mustn't just look at it from an international as an out of Africa point of view, but also we do have to uh, shine the lens on freedom of movement within the African continent as well. The next point, which relates to inequality between uh, Europe uh, and Africa in so far as this relationship is concerned, I'll go back to my earlier point around symmetry often, um, uh, this is horrible use of words, but symmetry often creates the semblance of asymmetry um, because we, we have the summit, now it was hosted in Brussels, so, so naturally you would have a greater focus on, on that. You also recognize that the AU and the EU are not the same creature, which is why you would have uh, African uh, heads of state, as well as the AU Commission, um, not always having the same position, but, but pushing for, for an agreement that reflects the multiplicity of actors on the African continent. And then you have a European Commission that uh, is still um, more um, better staffed in terms of numbers, but financially, uh, as well as human resources. So that asymmetry exists within and outside of summits. What I think is important and what we need to focus on is the ways in which we can be able to adjust what is otherwise a vertical relationship by way of finances and otherwise into a horizontal one. And perhaps this first step, uh, even by having the roundtables, I will say for myself personally, I actually felt that AU and EU leaders meeting in a round table a uh, less rigid format was perhaps a really good move. It was necessitated largely because of COVID if we're being blunt, but it allowed for more open and honest discussions. And I think we need to be moving towards that, but we cannot reject the fact that the asymmetry exists 
and it exists because the African continent is largely a developing continent and the European Union is largely made up of developed nations and we need to find a way that we balance those scales. Then the footnote, Mary, which is uh, to Nicholas, uh, please don't get me wrong, smuggling, trafficking of persons, um, even the issues related to refugee flows out of conflict-ridden areas are important issues. They have to be discussed. My point was not that they should be thrown away, but rather that sometimes, particularly on the question of irregular migration and smuggling and trafficking, that the, there's an overemphasis to the detriment of discussions around active engagement developmentally and otherwise, and also this issue of governance that you, that you raise now, because clumping migration and mobility with education, youth and culture may be good for optics, but we need to also have a conversation around the intersection with peace and security, for example, which then gets lost if you, if you, if you decide to lean one way over the other. Um, so that's perhaps just to, to add that. Uh, thank you, Mari. Thank you. Anna, you want to take the floor? Yes, just maybe quickly to react, because I see a lot of interesting questions are coming in. Um, what Niklas has said on the, I mean, I agree, I'm not sort of putting overly much emphasis on the declaration. It's just interesting that, to read the, the tone. But um, uh, what you mentioned on national competences, I think that is really key on the legal migration aspect. And here, really, I think there needs to be some thinking on the follow up. I mean, under the JAS, as I said, there was um, similar issues years back where EU and AU followed up in discussions, but you kind of always go back to um, where the competencies of the, the regional um, uh, organizations lie. And then that is mainly related to the issue of smuggling, which we know is important because you have um, you know, cooperation with Frontex. Uh, the there is a, the protection issue is uh, front and center with the joint uh, with the AU EU UN task force um, and then the return and readmission issue comes up but legal migration is then always yeah but we need to have the member states on board and even the follow up in any technical committee on mobility that is not there I think it may be difficult to really then have substantive discussions on that if the key uh, actors are not in the room. So I think these lessons need to, to be learned and taken into account to really make progress to connect the EU-AU partnership on migration to the legal migration dimension and, and bind in the member states from both the EU and the AU. Thank you. Can I um, maybe emphasize again to all of you, but um, Paolo here, he was uh, talking, one of the questions he raised is about um, uh, labor needs in Europe uh, in relation to demographic aging. And he mentions the former uh, home, uh, uh, DG Home Director General Stefano Manservisi um, about this. Um, is there any one, anything that you would like to say, Nicolas, uh, on that? Um, uh, then also there were a few points before I go to the other questions. The issue of framing. Uh, came uh, an important issue, Nicholas uh, and others. You could uh, maybe, I think it is uh, Anna um, um, uh, this time, Noel, Anna Noel, who has uh, raised this issue uh, about framing, that it's more about negative framing. And secondly, it didn't get, in terms of content, the attention it requires, while we know from European side migration and mobility still remains high in the national agenda at the same time at EU, we assume, uh, is uh, still didn't get the kind of attention that uh, it needed. Uh, is it because we are waiting for more details uh, of this uh, that the details will bring? But there was a mention of a few things that we need to reflect also, the issue of diaspora. Uh, and with diaspora, of course, remittances. Remittances has been mentioned but probably not in much detail. The issue of legal pathways um, that has been identified. Uh, and there, are, there is actually a question on legal pathways uh, from one of the uh, participants um, uh, that, um, and I think it is, um, 
uh, Tobias. He says, uh, uh, thank you for your interesting contributions. Uh, and this is related to um, uh, Muan Gaza. Uh, I think uh, um, Othelia is referring to Othelia. And he says, what is the, um, uh, the legal post that legal pathways to Europe should be the standard, he says, not an alternative to irregular migration. He's talking about the framing. Is it, re is it wrong to frame it as alternative to irregular migration legal pathways? Shouldn't it be by itself? Uh, um, and that it should be, how could be, how, how is this going to be achieved legal pathways? We have been talking for a long time. And in one recent event, I said legal pathways has been like waiting for Godot, uh, never to arrive. Um, and uh, are we talking about that? How is the, the mechanism for achieving that? Do we, are we progressing on, on those fronts? Uh, could you comment on this in general? And uh, we'll come back uh, to the other questions we have. Uh, I will give uh, Anna if you want to take a lead or uh, Nicholas. I'm sure that Anna would like to, to take the lead. Please, Anna, <laughs> go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's quite um, a number of, of questions. I think on that question um, is um, over that Paulo placed, um, where, you know, is there sort of more emphasis on EU annual identifying needs in terms of labor? I mean, there are the commission and, and maybe. Um, Nicholas can fill in, but there are more. There's more emphasis on connecting the whole sort of um, labor market demands and needs in the future to the question of mobility, and I think some EU member states do that to a greater extent than others. There's I'm we're currently doing a study um, mapping some of the EU member states, uh, notably Portugal, Estonia, and Netherlands, and Poland on that. Um, there's sort of slow movement, I would say, to connect that more um, in some countries more than in others. So, but I think over the long term that will definitely come because the needs will be more pressing, and that's why I mentioned it'll be important then to, for the AU and for African nations to also have a strategic view on how this relationship of labor mobility um, should be, um, yeah, organized or should be sort of characterized from from their side, um, and and what the interests are, whether it concerns brain drain and brain circulation and I see also one of the comments is there are some interesting lessons to be learned from existing initiatives and they may be small scale um, of, of brain gain thanks to um, circularity. What I gather though from private sector actors that are in need of recruiting labor migrants and that's mainly in the high school sector is that that idea of circularity is not their preferred option simply because they invest into people that are coming um, and and would like to keep them once they have sort of um, started to, to, you know, to understand the, the way of working and to be integrated in the business. Um, so I think it then depends on whether there's strong enough incentives policy wise to make circularity happen. And it obviously also depends on whether the migrants themselves like to be circular or like to stay. And that's, um, I think that's the question. Um, then the, the question on I think there's one interesting question I would like to pick on the um, the question, why has climate uh, not had a more predominant um, place yet? I also don't know, uh, honestly, I think there are sensitivities around this whole climate migration link, political sensitivities also in some African and European countries that may be really difficult to tackle. So maybe one of the reasons is that it's um, not sort of the strongest priority um, it, but it could also be that um, it, um, yeah, it's it's a very siloed. So um, there's different policy communities that start to talk about it, but at the higher political level, it didn't um, yet enter. But maybe here also, be happy to hear from Nicholas what his take is. Um, I think I expect that to definitely have to come in stronger in future discussions. Thank you, Anna. Uh, can you respond to? Carol, I think Carol's question about lessons learned from legal migration. Have the German and Belgian private initiatives of circular migration for young African professionals uh, been taken into account? Uh, maybe Nicholas also could respond to that, but he uh, brings this example whether 
uh, the issue of uh, the role of private sector, private initiative mm. uh, by small and medium industrial um, arrangement uh, uh, enterprise, uh, their eff effort in this regard, whether this reinforces the need for more legal migration and indeed it could be successful. Can you comment on that? I think there's an increasing emphasis on taking lessons that we've learned from these pilot um, activities or from initiatives of the past years. Um, and most of them, just to keep in mind, have been quite small scale still, but um, to take them into account going forward. So I think there is emphasis, but maybe, I mean, I only follow largely here the technical discussions at EU level, but yes, I do feel there is more sort of looking into to study them and, and take them into account in policies going forward. Um, but still, I think the main issue will be how to scale up um, the pilot schemes. I feel there is still a bit of a disconnect between policy communities here because when talking to migration actors, some of them, I, I feel their feedback is that they largely view these activities as good initiatives for you know, working with partner countries and comprehensive migration partnerships, but not necessarily as the tools for you know, um, making sure that the labor market in, for example, European countries um, has the, the labor it needs because they view them too small scale yet. And, and more sort of interesting projects, but not necessarily the, the tool for, for them to work with. But that can change. And I think um, here there still needs to be sort of the main work, how to really actually make them interesting tools of partnership that can create these win-win situations beyond the, yeah, beyond the pilot and beyond the smaller scale. Thank you. There is a specific question from, um... Yeah, Harry, may I, may I add something? I think uh, we are we are in the. Yes, I will area. come. I will come back to you. I would. I want to add two questions to you so yeah, that you don't can don't change the subject about the labor needs because I think it's a key one. Yeah, please go ahead. Then. Would you like to do that, or should I add two questions for you? No, please go. Uh, yes. Yeah. Add, add. Yes. Add one from Ellen uh, is uh, to you. Are there any discussion? at EU level about increasing legal pathways for low and medium skilled labor migrants, even on temporary beds. If the partnership, if this partnership uh, partnerships are allowed for more circular mobility as before, maybe that would uh, circumvent the problem of people staying and at the same time alleviating Europe's labor shortage. So win-win in as such, in a, as such. And Alia, and uh, good morning, Alia. Uh, um, she says uh, you, the question to you uh, about free movement protocols uh, have how the free movement arrangement, free movement in Africa, especially, um, uh, featured in the discussion on mobility. What kind of support can we expect from EU on on to to EU? Uh, and uh, even regional uh, free movement uh, protocols and arrangements regimes. Um, and broadly speaking, the support political, support capacity and funding. Uh, so could you talk a little bit about how the free movement issue, uh, including the technical uh, committee that you mentioned, um, came up uh, after this uh, meeting? You have these all questions to you. Nicholas, so thank you. Uh, please take time and uh, uh, try to reflect on those. Thank you. No, no, thank you. Thank you to you and thank you to the people that uh, ask this question. I think we have to, uh, to focus more on that because I have the feeling that uh, sometimes we don't give importance to what is happening. And uh, I have to say that uh, a lot of things are happening in terms of uh, legal pathways. Uh, and, we, uh, and definitely they are happening uh, uh, more and more uh, compared to what uh, happened uh, 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 a few years back. Let me start by saying something very concrete and very direct. <laughs> maybe, maybe you already know, but uh, you know the GDP, the GDP in Europe for the last 10 years, it increased by 48%, while in Africa, it increased by 33%. I mean, there was a, significant increase in GDP 
in the, for the last two years in both Africa and Europe. Let's talk about population. In Africa, the population for the last 10 years increased by 48%. Do you know how much it increased in Europe? By 1%. So when we talk about labor needs, I mean, and we talk at this uh, uh, demographic uh, uh, distribution, it is clear that there is a common future there. So the issue is how that can be uh, aligned together. So, and I think, I mean, I will not say that the whole Europe thinks uh, in this way, but I think there is more and more the awareness, the, the, the clear idea that this is what uh, the reality and that is why uh, uh, the important we give to the dialogue with uh, our uh, neighboring uh, African uh, 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 citizens and countries are so important. Um, I have to say that uh, 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 I think Anna is, is right when uh, she uh, mentioned that for high skilled people, probably the private sector uh, uh, prefers uh, a people that comes uh, with uh, a, a residence permit and can stay longer in, uh, in European countries. But uh, what we are, we are seeing, and, and we have had some example, for example, uh, and recently Portugal and Morocco, they signed uh, this circular migration agreement. They say that Spain and other had already before. Also, if we look at what is happening, for example, in Romania, a very, very interesting uh, uh, um, event, a, a phenomenon in which uh, Romanians are uh, emigrating to other European countries while they are receiving more and more uh, uh, migrants from coming from uh, Central uh, uh, Asia. No? So I, I think uh, uh, the, there are uh, more and more initiatives. Uh, uh, these initiatives are done at the national level and not done at European level, but the European institutions are supporting those efforts. And, and sometimes even uh, gratifying those efforts. And, and this is becoming more and more, I think there are more and more doors are open and I think we have to continue uh, pushing for that. I, I also agree about the, that climate should have, should be more predominant in future discussions. If you look, not don't, don't focus only on the migration paragraph. If you go to other paragraphs, you will see how uh, uh, climate and climate change is more and more uh, present. But I agree with you, Anna, that should be done in this way. Uh, <clears throat> and about the free movement, the, <coughs> the EU is already supporting the African Union Commission for the implementation of these free movement of protocols. Uh, the, the, uh, I think Otilia mentioned that the, the problem now is more based about how to for African countries to ratify this protocol and to uh, put that uh, in, in, in practice. And, and it is uh, some, uh, something to be highlighted, the fact that some key countries like uh, Ethiopia or Rwanda, they took the initiative to move forward in that direction and this will continue. And the EU, uh, I think uh, we are in a position of, of, uh, of supporting, but uh, always keeping in mind that the ownership of this process belongs to the to the African institution and the African countries. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolas. Uh, Othelia, would you like to, to, to reflect on any of these issues? Um, I think between Nicolas and Anna, um, you know, they've covered uh, much of it. Uh, but to say just one minor thing around uh, uh, legal labor migration pathways, but then also around uh, skills. Um, it's often framed as though the skills that are required, whether it's within the African continent or within the EU are primarily tertiary uh, skills. When we've actually seen, uh, uh, and, and, and uh, I'll cite some country examples, but for example, when we've seen the utility of having, um, uh, I, want, I don't want to call it low skilled, but uh, differently skilled, um, uh, individuals, menial labor in, in far communities in the north of Italy, in, uh, in the car industry, even in, in, in Germany and in construction uh, across, um, uh, across Europe. Likewise, on the African side as well, we have seen a tendency towards 
uh, regarding only as critical skills, those skills that are tertiary skills, when particularly for a developing continent, what we do need is a lot of builders, bricklayers, uh, uh, and, and people that can be able to, to assist in the, in the building and the development of, of our spaces. So in line with um, changing the way we speak about migration, I think we also need to change the way in which we think about labor migration specifically. And that will require, as a, as a final note, it will actually require countries to have an internal exercise first, a proper internal exercise. So it, 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 it's the departments for labor, or those dealing with enterprise, the departments for home affairs, uh, likewise for, for internal affairs, actually looking inwards to see what are the capacity gaps. Often it's companies that will see this, which is why the Global Skills Partnership are centered around companies but the reality is, unless there is, you know, cross-sectional uh, check of what the real labor needs are, I do worry that we'll continue with historic lists of what's needed when the reality of today is not necessarily the, the um, is not necessarily the same. And so it is about having those internal, um, but not necessarily waiting until those internal checks are done in order to stimulate uh, a better or improved legal labor migration pathways, but rather that that should be part of, of, of the process. And I know a number of countries are already doing this, but it's not being done at a continental level because, and I stress this, and someone in the comments also alluded to this, which is when it comes to legal labor migration pathways, even with the EU that has a Schengen zone, it's still a national competence issue. Um, and because it's still a national competence issue, the exercise at sub-regional and regional level that needs to also happen isn't happening um, as, as, much as, they, as much as it should. Um, and to add to Anna's uh, point around scaling up, we are seeing good small case examples but we need to see what this looks like at national, sub-regional and continental level, because unfortunately it's, it's, it's not enough and, and, and we do need to, to see uh, scaling up. Thank you. Uh, let me take you to the next question. Um, uh, Jes Jesper uh, raised about um, uh, the risk that Europe's security concern dominating the space for implementation and uh, um, as we have seen with uh, the difficult negotiation around the new eu pact on asylum and migration he says uh, and that is in relation to whether um, security concerns are taking more dominance in these uh, partnerships and meetings it seems that the reasoning still is first we stop irregular migration then we can talk about legal pathways also. He's raised about legal pathways again. Um, uh, what would it take to move away from this European logic, he, he asks. Now, um, we know Africa is facing significant security issues, the wave of coups, uh, wars, and that we have also terrorism, um, terrorist attacks increasing in different parts, special, specific, especially specific areas like from Somalia to the Sahel. Um, uh, maybe Nicholas and others could react to that, whether um, security was predominant than any. If you see Maki Sal's speech, of course, you would immediately understand security was dominant in the speech. Um, but I think it's uh, something to reflect on if uh, security. And the second associate to that, and I want to raise it is, um, we didn't mention much um, about return readmission and reintegration, which is a big issue, uh, in my opinion, in almost defining, if you wish, even determining the partnership on migration and mobility. Is that the reason why we are having this national competence being inserted in this kind of documents? We didn't see the national competence as such taking prominent place in a very short document previously. Uh, now, the national competence was inserted probably, in my assumption, 
from European side, not necessarily Africa's side. And this, um, can you comment on that in general? And this relates to one of the questions we, we saw here um, um, by Felicitas, Felicitas uh, that on the approach of EU-AU cooperation, EU has introduced Team Europe initiative in order for EU member states to join and come together. At the same time, EU very much follows a decentralized approach with Africa and enters as EU cooperation with national bilateral. It goes sometimes bilateral um, uh, without necessarily involving EU. Was that discussed or what is the way forward regarding EU, EU partnership cooperation and between EU and member states directly? Whether this, this dynamics has been there, um, uh, uh, going multilateral when possible and bilateral when necessary. Uh, and this creates a dynamism in the partnership. Can you comment on that? Uh, again, uh, whoever wants to take a lead, I will allow uh, to, for you to okay. take. Okay, I will, I will take the lead this time. Lead. Go ahead. Yes. <laughs> well, first, uh, I do not agree that security was the predominant approach. I think, and I said that at the beginning, that uh, we should all uh, 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 recognize the fact that we are keeping the same language, talking about comprehensive and joint efforts. And that, is, and that was real in the, in the tone of the discussion that at least I, I witnessed. So I, I, I do not agree with that, uh, putting that. I think this is something that we are assuming without really a, a good knowledge of, of what happened uh, last week. I, I, I have to contradict you, uh, Mahari, about the, Mahari, about the National competence, unfortunately, it was a mention that appears already, has been there for some time now. It is not uh, new, but you are right about that this came from the European side. I think uh, in some way, we should not look at it in a, in a negative side. Uh, you should look at it at, at the positive side, as Anna said before, because when talking in particular about legal pathways, competencies are normally at national level. So what, it, what uh, I think, the, what, what I mentioned before the issue of maturity in the dialogue, it was that whether we like it or not, uh, we, have to be, um, mul we have to multiply our avenues of dialogue with our African partners when talking about migration and mobility. It means we have to continue combining the efforts at bilateral level with the efforts at uh, regional levels. And we have these two big processes, the Rabat and Khartoum processes, that are working well, in particular the Rabat process, the Rabat process, and everything is touched uh, there. We need to combine that also with the uh, joint ballet action plan and with the continental, with the continent-to-continent -continent dialogue. And combining all of them, I think this is the, the answer. Uh, I don't know what you mean when you talk about Macky Sall, because the speech and the contribution of Macky Sall and the insistence of President Macky Sall was always about investment, and I think he managed to to create a, a positive atmosphere about that and look at the, the declaration, not all uh, how uh, predominant is the investment package and the GAT, global gateway investment package. And this was, I mean, pushed strongly by President Makisal, uh, 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 much stronger than any other, any other issue. And about the Team Europe initiatives, well, this is a way and, uh, of coordinating efforts inside Europe and, and I, I am convinced, or I, and I am working around that, that this effort should be integrated in what we do with our uh, two processes, with the uh, uh, Rabat and Khartoum processes, because the genuine dialogue on migration and mobility between Europeans and Africans, from my point of view, uh, are happening at the, at the processes level. And when, when I participate in meetings in the, uh, of the Rabat process, of the cartoon process is where I see uh, how, uh, how uh, implicated are both uh, 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 European partners and African partners to work about that. So this will be my quick reaction to your Thank you. Anyone of you, um, Anna, Anna Knowles or? Um... Yes, I can. Yeah. Go ahead, Anna. I can yeah. add maybe on, on the question that Jesper posed on, will a more security dominant approach um, 
yeah, dom dominate the implementation space. Um, I mean, I, I agree with Nicholas to some extent, but I may have a bit of a different take. I think what we've seen is that indeed the, the discussions are taking place differently and they're not necessarily dominated by only return readmission or smuggling. They are important elements, but the framing may have changed a bit. I still see though that at national level, obviously the strong interest to tackle the question of smuggling and return and readmission is there. Um, and it's probably stronger than, and still than focusing on legal pathways or, or some of the other topics. And, and in some of the EU member states also, I think the question of legal opportunities and migration um, uh, pathways is sort of seen in the light of comprehensive partnership and balance, but yes, with the intent to possibly, you know, use that as one of the incentives or levers to actually get more cooperation and return readmission. The similar discussions do happen at the level of the EU Commission with the NDG. So it's, I think it's not necessarily fair to say that this may not be an issue overall. I think that if we look at also how the French presidency has dealt with the topics, I think there was stronger emphasis still on um, the European interest on, on smuggling and an irregular migration, which, which is a fair interest, one could say, but it's definitely then, um, you know, balanced towards European interest and, and narrative. So um, I think we have to monitor that still. Um, so to me, there is some risk and what would it take to get away from it? I mean, I think over time, as we've mentioned, the, the labor market needs will probably grow bigger and then it's an economic interest to, to have a more balanced approach next to a political one. I think that will grow stronger. Um, but also I think the African Union side and the African countries are much more assertive and stronger in defending their, their um, aspects and, and not sort of talking about migration only in European terms. So I think it, that's why also one of the elements why it has been, been changing. In, in case Otilia, we want to come in, I want to ask one question specifically raised to you. Um, and this Ireka uh, mentions the, you. it says you mentioned the push and pull approach that didn't produce viable solutions over the last 20 years. And this, the question is, what could be an alternative approach to migration? Could you add this one and react to the uh, discussion already we have? Uh, thank you very much, and thanks for, for that question as well. So first on this question around uh, securitized uh, migration approaches, I, I, I think we mustn't just uh, dismiss the very real reality that uh, the questions around migration governance have been uh, overridden in part by efforts to contain migration, and the best mechanism that has been adopted to do that is securitized. And the reason we mustn't dismiss that is because even the project around free movement of people on the African continent has now suffered that as a major uh, hurdle and roadblock. So for example, if you have mechanisms and, and, and I assisted a specific study looking at Niger uh, before, where for example, in ECOWAS, you have relative freedom of movement, but if you have an externalized securitized approach within an ECOWAS member state, it means this impacts an existing mechanism for freedom of movement, even if intentions are supposedly good. So even if it's a reduced focus, there has to be a complete rethinking around the best ways to enhance migration governance. And I say this and I'll stress a point that I made earlier, which is, for as long as people are willing and do move, if they're unable to follow legal channels, we've actually seen that it increases their uh, probability of using irregular means, which carry the risks that we've all discussed. Now, what happens is it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy, right? So it's to say, but we needed security because if we had security, this wouldn't have happened without understanding that the reason that we have an increase in numbers of people taking dangerous routes is because the legal channels are as constrained and this becomes, however dangerous it may seem to you and I, it becomes the, the, the easier channel. 
which then connects to the question around push and pull factors. It's not to say that we cannot have a discussion around what motivates people, whether voluntarily or involuntarily, to move from one place and to another. It's to recognize that this is not often a, a, a ticking uh, list exercise to say these are the push factors out of the country because we see, for example, even in areas that are conflict affected, there are some people who choose to stay. Uh, we see in areas where, for example, I often use, and, and, and uh, Anna, you alluded to this uh, climate question, where in the absence of voluntary, well-planned relocation uh, as part of an adaptation strategy, you see that communities that are regularly affected by climate impacts just don't move away. They still want to be proximate to, to home. So what you find is you find an increase in internally displaced people in countries like Mozambique, in Zimbabwe, in the southern part of Malawi, and in Madagascar. Because despite the fact that they have uh, faced regular cyclones over the past 20 years, their choice is still to remain as close to home as possible. So you need to accept and understand that complexity, which is a difficult exercise from a, from a policy point of view, because you're asking policymakers to consider individual needs. But we already do this in respect of asylum seekers, right? Assessments, even where there's, be, there's a general um, uh, subjective assessment, we still see that cases are done on an individual basis why this can't be thought of in respect of uh, what is considered as voluntary or economic or governance related migration um, is, is for me a, a, a question because it's possible, but it really just involves rethinking, um, uh, having generalized phrases for why people move uh, and really focusing uh, where possible on, on, on individual uh, reasons for migrating. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I want to take you, uh, because we are finalizing in the next um, seven minutes or so, I want to take you to, as a follow-up, um, uh, there is one question from Vina about um, how I, I think Africa perceives the EU establishing status agreement with African countries to enable Frontex the EU border and Coast Guard Agency to support border management and deploy liaison officers in African countries. What are the risks of this kind of cooperation on border security? And it goes to uh, migration governance, security that would need to be taken into account beside the already mentioned accountability and human rights issues that Frontex is confronted with already within the EU. And this goes to the externalization of uh, border governance, European go border governance within Africa. Can you comment on that in relation to the previous question that we had? But also, uh, Anna, uh, I think earlier you mentioned about climate change, uh, Anna Knowles, uh, Noll, and that is just to raise if there is anything you would like to add um, on the question by Helena, and uh, that is about, um, uh, it's not yet the, the partnership it has not yet put climate induced displacement and migration higher up in the agenda. Do you believe that is the case? And uh, I know uh, Nicholas has mentioned that climate change may be needed more prominence and it should be, uh, but could you talk about that? And it appears that um, COP26 should have provided a strong uh, momentum, if you wish, um, to do that. Uh, um, and if you could talk a little bit about that. And Nicholas, I want to ask you, uh, what kind of follow-up are we expecting from you uh, to the EUTF um, in Africa? Uh, <clears throat> can you talk a little bit how it will be related? And one of the questions I raised is, uh, now we have, we have the, um, the joint vision declared. Uh, what will be the follow-up in general? What is the idea after this uh, in terms of detailing, providing a little bit detail uh, on, on that? 
Um, I will leave it here. And if time permits, I'll go to back to the other questions. But uh, could we re respond to these uh, questions? Uh, thanks and a lot. Maybe, for... sorry, sorry. Uh, uh, maybe in relation to that, and it goes to the issue of going bilateral. And this is Rebecca saying the DG Home Af Affairs Commissioner um, went to Niger and Senegal to finalize arrangements and hold discussion on migration management. Uh, whose focus was on combating illegal migration, cross-border crime, uh, and increasing return and readmission agreement. To what extent will these uh, arrangements res respect the EU policy coherence, commitment on sustainable development, and match um, de development objectives of the countries that have been visited? Could you talk a little bit on that? And we'll end uh, the, the, uh, um, the questions here and will reflect, I will give you also additional one or minutes in addition to your reflections to finalize the session. Um, I'll be quite brief because I'm mindful of, of the time. So on the proposition for Frontex um, essentially extending um, its, its territorial reach uh, out of uh, Europe onto the African continent, I, I think that is a horrible idea to be, to be quite blunt. Um, I always try to think of it in the reverse, uh, having uh, African border guards um, between uh, the Netherlands and Luxembourg or Belgium and France, um, it wouldn't be conceivable. And I think uh, while you can have, which has been the case, uh, upskilling of existing uh, African border management authorities with the support of the European partners, it has to be done with the understanding that the, the, the African uh, partners remain the primary port of call, mind the pan they, um, and they also are the ones primarily responsible for migration governance. You cannot, in the same vein that you speak of national competence, also speak of an internationalized uh, component insofar as it extends the, the borders of Europe. I think that that would be untenable. And I, and, I, and I cannot imagine the same being proposed going uh, eastwards into, into the Middle East and, uh, and, and, and end there, uh, Mary. Thank you so much, um, Otilia and Anna. Yes, thank you. Um, just maybe quickly to add to the question of, of Frontex and activities in, in Africa. I mean, the, the outcome declaration states a commitment to work in full respect of human rights and international law. Um, but I think still also with the regard to Frontex and the scrutiny it faces, it has to be filled with life in, in the partnership with African countries. And I think civil society researchers really play a strong role also in monitoring and um, carefully looking at the engagement um, of Frontex in, in Africa. Um, I, I think that um, will definitely have to, to be paid attention to um, in, the, in the discussions about protection. Um, on climate change, I mean, as I mentioned before, I think it will need to come stronger into the, the priority of the discussion, maybe in the follow up. And I think it just requires bringing together a number of sort of strands of siloed discussions happening. And yes, in the COP, it has um, in, sort of increased um, focus on, on migration and mobility also in the context of climatic changes. Um, and as I said before, the, there are discussions on, on both sides, but they sort of politically are not yet sort of brought together to, to discuss at this level, which I, I expect at some point and may happen. Um, for me, these discussions are especially important when it concerns movement on the African continent. As um, Otilia has mentioned, climatic change usually triggers movement first internally, but then also um, across borders, but, but mainly more relevant for intra-African migration. Um, uh, and as well as the question of protection, you know, the whole discussion about um, refugees um, internally displaced, but also is there a different category of people that have to move due to climatic changes. Um, I also leave it, it here. I think my final point is that it's really, for me, interesting to also see what the follow-up and monitoring will be and then what the exact sort of arrangement of the EU-AU technical committee maybe on mobility will be. 
uh, how it links to you know the commission to commission meetings on migration and mobility and then as i said before how the eu member states what role they play and how they can be associated and closely aligned especially when it concerns labor migration you see uh, all questions go to nicolas so uh, even from anna uh, uh, nicolas you have the floor now thank you uh, first of all let me let me say something about frontex because maybe we are assuming things that are not real or we are considering frontex as an independent entity without scrutiny from from uh, international law or, or from the european institution which is not true so let me reassure uh, Otilia that uh, Frontex is not a, a, a free electron uh, going to countries and proposing things that are not uh, that do not respect that. I mean, Frontex is a, is a, a is an agency, an implementing agency from the European Union, and subject to the same limitation in their action at the European Union. And I, I agree with Anna that the civil society, African governments, but also uh, European institutions should play a, 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 a look, a close look to make sure that uh, uh, all actions are integrated in, the, in, the, in this comprehensive vision about mobility and migration. Uh, let me say also, uh, before Anna mentioned return readmission and smuggling together, I think we have to be clear. Let me insist on that. Eh? I mean, one thing is return readmission and reintegration, Another thing is smuggling. Smuggling is, is a criminality, is a criminal action, and we have to fight that. When talking about return, uh, readmission and reintegration, I am going to say something that maybe I should not say, but I think there is more and more the uh, idea, uh, the common idea that return, uh, readmission, and reintegration is linked also to legal pathways. So that there is like a balance there in which the interests of both sides could. Uh, could combine. And, 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 and this is the reality, whether we like it or not. I mean, countries that are more, uh, uh, let's say, more open to, uh, uh, to recover their own nationals that could not be, that could be, uh, uh, that could have an irregular status in European countries could benefit more from a legal pathway. So uh, I'm not interpreting, I'm just saying what I see and I observe more and more in the discussion. And uh, finally, I would like to say two ideas, they are too close. First, colleagues, please do not uh, focus only on the declaration. Let's try also to see the reality of figures. And I think the reality of figures about migration and mobility between Africa and Europe are much more positive than what we express in the declaration. And what, what some member states uh, uh, are, are willing to to openly inform their citizens. Why? Because we know that there are some, uh, um, unfortunately, some negative current opinion about migration and mobility, and politicians and leaders try to deal with that in the best way they can. And finally, on my point of view about the follow-up, yes, I'm curious also to know more about the, <coughs> this EU-AU Technical Committee on Mobility, and, and I will be happy to share more with you in the future whenever they will be more consolidated. But I would like to insist that for me, the best avenues that we have created for the last year are the dialogues, the existing dialogues, the combination of this bilateral, regional, continental dialogue. That has enriched a lot our discussions and our, our uh, sincerity, the sincerity of our exchanges. And I think is there are, uh, this, this combination of dialogues are also producing very good result. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have. I want to take one minute, additional minute, because there has been one question, uh, two questions actually, which we didn't address. One is um, on the issue of, uh, there is from Melania, I don't know whether it is uh, Melania, whether there is any, um, any one of you knowledgeable about that, but uh, she asks about, I understand the Chinese have started with training on education systems in Africa. Does anyone have more information on this? Maybe you could provide her if there is anything about that. And the second one, uh, there was about um, the issue of uh, uh, bridging the uh, research gap, uh, the evidence and uh, by from one of the questions, uh, whether the declaration had the potential to narrow 
the gap uh, between evidence on development impact uh, uh, impact of migration, I think, to human mobility on migration and human mobility and political practice on migration, especially the restrictions and securitization. Um, does anyone of you want to respond? I didn't raise them because um, they are not really, um, how do I say, exactly uh, falling within the preparation of uh, our meeting for, for this. Yeah, I would like only to say that uh, in this Erasmus uh, Mundus initiative, that in fact promote uh, linkages and exchanges between universities and educational centers in Europe and the rest of the world, the, uh, the uh, allocation uh, uh, going to Africa, I mean, for exchanges with African educational centers for the next six years have multiplied by four. It means giving the priority to Africa in the, for the next six years in terms is just to respond to this research gap. Thank you. Yeah, I want to add there the Pan-African University and its partnership with Europe um, on this is one of the most important if you want about the education system. I would like you to look at how Pan-African University is cooperating with uh, European universities and uh, the European institutions. Uh, I think it's a very important area to look at. Um, Otilia or Anna, if you have any final points, Sylvia, um, do you have? No. Yeah, please, Otilia, go ahead. Uh, nothing uh, extra really to add, but to say, and I think the question around uh, uh, different ways of engaging, whether it's uh, China or even the, the, the EU, I think is an important one because we can have conversations about the importance of education, about skills development, but that also has to be a, a, a two-way street in some regards. So while it's framed in the way of a question, I think uh, by way of recommendation also, um, uh, they, there's much that can be said. And then finally, um, I did respond briefly in the, in the Q&A section, but uh, to stress something that Nicolas uh, said as well, the declaration is but one short document that articulates or summarizes what has been, uh, what has been discussed. Um, as it reads at the moment on the migration mobility uh, aspect, um, it doesn't bridge any gap, so to speak. It just states the, the status quo, uh, but the real challenge or, or the real issue is in, in the practice and in shifting practice more towards uh, development over security. Well, I think now final words uh, of thanks uh, to um, the participants um, and uh, to uh, the speakers, uh, Nicolas uh, Borgan Berlanga Martinez and um, Otilia Anna um, Manguanche and also Anna Knoll uh, for your uh, excellent presentation and taking us through the um, the contents of the recent AU EU um, summit, and I would like to take this uh, opportunity also to thank my colleagues from EPC and Madam uh, for uh, arranging this uh, session webinar, and thank you all and uh, good day to all of you. Bye bye.